prophetic bent. But those were seven literal churches. So the issues and the things that those letters deal with dealt with people who occupied those seven churches. You all do know what kind of folk occupied the seven churches. They were sinners. And, 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 and those sinners back then have the same, the same, had the same problems that we sinners today have. And that's, that's what makes the contents of those letters applicable to the church of today. So all seven churches were dealing with seven sinners, seven sets of sinners that were geographically dispersed. So those letters are so powerful, so potent, especially as we look at the contents therein related to the, what's your sample before we have a couple? couple. The rebellion, yeah, redemption. Yeah, that's, 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 when you look at these letters from a rebellion and redemption perspective, they make a whole heap of sense. With that said, let's look at our memory text in Revelation 3, verse number 20. That's Revelation chapter 3, verse number 20. Now, I, I want to look at one thing here, and then I want to jump into Sunday's lesson by God's grace. So, who's speaking here? Jesus. And what does Jesus say? So he stands at the door, and what's he doing? All right, so, 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 so he wants to come in and help to give, and that's, that's, that's an overwhelming drive. But, but it's, 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 it's things, things here that shows the process that he uses to get in that's fascinating, at least to me. So if so I stand here and let's assume this is a door, what am I making? So he's making noise to get in. And then when he gets to the door, does he sign language his way in? What does he say he will do? What is he, what, what, what will the recipient have an opportunity? So if he's hearing his voice, means he's talking. So he's knocking and he's talking. In other words, who is the proactive one here to establish the conversation? You should never forget that. In all seven letters, he is the proactive one. When it, when it comes, comes to, to rebe the rebellion, rebellion as, as well as redemption, redemption. God, God was the proactive pro one to quell, quell the rebellion. rebellion. He's, he's the proactive pro pro one, one to get rid of the rebellion. rebellion. And he's, and he's the proactive pro one to redeem folk from the rebellion. rebellion. It, it starts, ends, and, and all in the middle. middle. It's, it's about, about him. him. We just have to be the recipients and the beneficiaries. So let's look at Ephesus. Revelation 2. Someone read for us the first two, three verses of Revelation 2. May we pause for a moment? So if we go back to Revelation chapter 1, what do the seven golden candlesticks represent? The churches, okay? And what do the seven stars represent? And what did the writer in Hebrews tell us that the reason for angels? Why did God put them here? And who are they to be ministering to? Those who are heirs of salvation. And so before he tells us what sin, it's very important to know who said it. So where is this speaker relative to the seven golden candlesticks which represent the seven churches? Where is he? And so if you're walking among somebody, what do you recognize about him? So let me be really simplistic. So if I'm standing over here and I see Brother JJ 
or maybe Brother J.J. is 100 yards away, I can see Brother J.J. What would be a difference in the experience of me and Brother J.J. there and if I'm right here with Brother J.J. and I'm hanging around and I'm walking around and then I can smell him and, and, and just all this stuff. What's the difference in the experience? It's personal. What do you notice about folk when you're up on them that you can't notice them 100 yards away without a set of optical assistance? Their flaws. Their flaws, their imperfection. You know, she real cute from this one. What else do you learn about folk when you get up on them? When you're hanging around them and you're in the midst of them? That's why I'm amazed, sis, when folk, kids, say stuff that embarrasses them. I'm amazed that they're amazed that their kids can embarrass them. Who better to embarrass you than the folk that see you all the time that you're weak? After they done picked at you and picked at you and picked at you, you told them to sit down for the 20th time. And then at that moment, you go off. And they, they, that's what they remember. They don't tell about the 20 times that you ask them to sit down. They never repeat that. They only, my mama said this, my daddy said that. My point being, when you're in close proximity and you're in the midst of something, you understand a lot about it. And so he sees it, and that's who he is. Now, that's the who. What does the one who's intimately familiar with the people at Ephesus say? Verse 2. church that fits that criteria. If, if, if I tell you, if, 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 you if, if someone held a gift to send you to a church to pastor, and you say, well, what's those folk like? And they say, well, they work, they labor, they're patient, they can't stand that which that is evil. They've tried the false apostles and those who are liars. They've borne with patience, and for my name's sake, they've labored. This, if Jesus gave you that criteria, would that be a church you want to go pastor over here? Okay. Yeah, that's, that's the kind of church you want to be a part of. But what I love about this, yes, sir. So let, let's, 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 let's investigate what. Who does the speaking in verse 1? And who's he talking to? To the angel. And what is he asking the angel to do? And so what is he telling the angel to tell the people? Now, you all just quoted Hebrews 1, that they're ministering spirits sent to help those who are heirs of salvation. And so what I love about this letter is that a church can have all of these wonderful characteristics, but there's always this three-letter word. Actually, in King James, it's a little longer. How does verse 4 start out? So that's a King's English way of saying, but... However, and that's okay because we don't have to beat ourselves up about that because there has always, ever since the fall of man in the garden, there has always been a nevertheless. Even the one brother that the Bible didn't feel compelled to give us a lot of detail that God took him, there was a book, there was a nevertheless in Enoch's life. Yes, sir.
Any thoughts on that? Yes, sir. I will simply respond to that by saying I never read these letters without DNA. It is a challenge for me to work through the historical posture this church makes on these letters. It's work. Of all the things I teach and preach, that is work to talk about the early church, to talk about the church in Rome. I'm thinking, okay, I'm good with the history, but I'm really interested in how this, and it validates that God has been over the church throughout time. Okay, I'm great there. But what really interests me is how do the contents of these letters affect the body now? Because right now is when I'm getting that stick put across my head every day. Right now is when I'm on my knees asking God, Lord, how long? I remember the first time I read Daniel, especially Daniel 9, 10, 11. I got real confused. Because I had read Daniel 1 through 7. And he's praying to God. And he's doing all this confessing. And, and he uses his pronoun, we have sinned. We have done dishonor to you. We have not. I'm like, whoa, whoa, bro. You're the guy who didn't eat the king's meat. Why are you saying we? You're the guy who when Nebuchadnezzar said he was going to kill off all the wise men, you go in to have a prayer meeting, you were saved. So if you had been killed, it had been all good. Why were you praying for everybody? You're the guy that continued to pray in spite of the king's decree. Kept your window open. So why is it when you're praying to God, you're using the pronoun we? Because there's something about the we. Yes, ma'am. I want to address that. I got a hand here, but I want to come back because that's some real good juice in that in that orange. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Mm. So, so, so let's, let's talk about this. What barrier is broken when we start talking about we and us? What, what concept draws it to a we and an us? Anybody? There's some humility. And when do people have a tendency to get the most, I'm going to make up a word, Humblest. Especially church folk. When do church folk humble up? Say it loudly. So what type of wrong do we really humble up? What type of wrong take, takes us from being Pharisee and individualist to being about the collective? And when, well, well, okay, so y'all won't talk around it. That's all right, that's all right, that's all right. What breaks a Pharisee from being Pharisaic? What does he or she become cognizant of? They are a sinner. And I'm telling you, Elder Gibb, when you become so super cognizant of the fact that you are despicable, you, start, you stop using pronouns like me and I because you don't even want to deal with me and I. And you start looking around, shining your eyes, saying, where's some we and us? 
I got to have some, I got to have some us. I told you all, there was a time I, I, I just felt like me and Jesus were going to get so tight, we'd be on the mountain, I ain't need none of y'all. But y'all wasn't studying y'all Bible, and I'm, I'm just trying to, I mean, when I showed up, I'm trying to figure out why, how could people who had all this Bible knowledge not know their Bible? And so I said to myself, oh, okay, I see God's going to be just me and you. Till I became super cocky. It's about us. It's about the we. It's about the hour. And you know who has that, that spirit to the greatest degree? The one who was sinless. All God talks about is us and we and our. Jesus didn't need us. But in John 17, what is he praying? Lord, make them one in us as I'm in you and you are in me. That other spirit, me, mine, I want to be like the most high. I want to exalt my. That's why I listen to people when they talk. When they go, I, I, me, 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 I know who's driving that train. Yes, sir. I want to look at a verse, and I want to come back to this because you're leading us down a, an area that's so quite powerful. Um, what's God's problem with the church at Ephesus, this hardworking, patient-filled, can't-stand, false preacher church? What's his problem with it? Verse number four. Now, for Gates, I got a question for you. How in the world can I, has born and has patient, and for his name's sake, labor, and not faint it, but I ain't loving him the way I ought to love him? How does those two go together? Yes, ma'am. So, so let's, 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 let's talk about this. So let's use Bible terms to define, let's use the Bible to divide, define Bible terms. Now, the Bible says that God says you've left your first love. Is that, is that correct? And, and so, so we'll let, I want to ask that because see, that, see, that's all these letters doing for me, Elder Gibb, is asking me about me. How do you leave your first love? How does this happen? How do you leave your first love? But, who, but that, see, I'm challenged with that because before he tells them they left their first love, he told them that they laboring for the one who was supposed to be his first, their first love. How is that possible? How can you be laboring for the one who's supposed to be your first love, but you done left your first love? I mean, that's what the text says, right? Okay, okay, I can buy that. Yes, sir, brother JJ. Sure. <laughs> no, brother JJ, JJ you don't hit you don't hit the nail on the head. So, so you so caught into what you're doing, you done lost sight of who told why you were doing it. Okay, 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 okay. See, see, uh, I will say this, and Sister Evelyn, I see your hand. For some of us, see, some of you saints don't have this problem, but for some of us, this concept is easy to grasp. 
Because some of us, if we don't have a why, we don't do it. And because I said, you know how many whippings I took based on because I said so? I had to have more than that. Well, why should I do this? Because I said so. Okay, okay, that makes no sense. You know how many grown folk I dealt with as a child who gave me reasons that made no sense? And so that logic, I always had to have a why. Well, when Jesus saved me, I got it. Because I'm still, people say, well, you need to stop doing this. I'm like, why? And if you don't tell me because Jesus said so, I, I, don't, I don't care what you're saying. What? Well, you know, we are the, no, I don't know. I need the reason. And it drives, see, those of us with that temperament, it drives everything we do. Why? Because Jesus said so. Why do you go to church on Saturday? Jesus said so, because I love Jesus. Why you don't eat? Because Jesus said so. Why do you pay in tithe? Because Jesus said so. See, we're real simple-minded. So, see, I'm Elder Gibb. I'm sorry, forgive me, Elder Gibb. All right, so let's, let's put a pin there. The writer in Hebrew says, those whom God loves, what does he do? So the very fact that God is now chastening, chastening this church at Ephesus is reflective of what? How, what is his sentiment towards the church? He loves them. And what's the, what's the, what's the six-letter word he tells the church? What's, how do they solve their problem? Say it loud, bro. We don't like that word. So who is he telling to repent? A church. So a church, to Elder Gibbs' point, that's out doing God's work, but has left their first love, that is not being driven by the why, and more specifically the who, how does it solve its problems? How does it solve its problems? Before holding on, Elder Tui, what did the, Jesus tell the angel to write down? What did he tell the church at Ephesus to do? Okay, let's read. No, 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 folk, folk, no, no, no. Let's read. Let's read. Let's read. All right? Verse 4, you've lost your, lost your first love. Somebody start verse, verse 5. And do what? Repent. Look how far you've fallen and repent. So how do we repent? What leads us to repentance? Okay, all right, so it's going to be one of those mornings. No problem, no problem, no problem. Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 2, verse number 4. Look how far you've fallen, the text says, and repent. But what leads me to repent? Romans chapter 2, verse number 4. It's in question form. Anyone? The goodness of God leads me to repent. So if I'm working and I've left my first love and I'm doing all of the things that Church of Ephesus is doing and God tells me to repent and the Bible says that the goodness of God leads me to repent, then what must a church that's so ingrained in work and in activity and serving, yet they've left their first love, 
what's the two things God said to do? Look how far you've fallen and repent. And in order to repent, what must I experience? According to Romans 2, 4. The goodness of God. See, it ain't the trepidations and the fire. That ain't going to help me repent. That's going to scare me to death. I mean, out of Jesus' own mouth, he says in, in Matthew 25, 41, that the fire is made for the devil and his angels. You all know how good I felt, because I had three siblings. There's four of us. Y'all know how good I felt when mama told, told us that folk were going to get whipped, and I wasn't in the number that was getting whipping? You know how good that feels? For your elders to pull out a strap and you realize, oh, this ain't for you? Woo, boy, you just be jumping on all this. That's it. The fire, excuse the expression, ain't for us. So why are we so consumed with the fire? The fire can't make us repent. The fire doesn't lead us to repentance. The plagues don't lead us. Y'all do know the plagues ain't for us. Y'all did read it over it. See, God is consistent. God is consistent. We'll be here. The plagues are falling, but they ain't for us. So why are we so consumed with the plagues? Oh, you know, there are going to be several less plagues. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, that's consequential. That's just going to happen. What leads us to repentance is the fact that the plagues are going to be falling, and they ain't going to be on me. The fact that the fire is going to fall, and it ain't for me. The goodness of God. Point and then point. Yes, sir. I want to come, oh, no, no. Brother, your point, and we're coming back to it because there's some wonderful stuff there. Yes, sir. Mm-hmm. So I, I want to look at, I, I want to talk about the dutifulness and the changing of the image of God, because there, there are two texts that come in my mind there, right? One is in Romans 1, the other is in Acts 17. Both, the writer of both texts says the same thing. Can, can we, let's look at the one in Acts 17, because this, this is what he's talking to the people at Athens. But talking about changing the image of God, the question I have is, what do we typically change it into? Look at verse 29. This is what we start thinking God to be. Anybody? Acts 17, 29. See, gold, silver, or stone, it's something that, you said the key word earlier, that we can control. The reason we defame God's image is because we want an image of God that we can control cause and effect. I serve, you are obligated to address me. If I do, then you're obligated to address me. If I give, then we, we, we excuse the expression, 
but we read, that's why I'm so glad that text in Corinthians is there, but we generally think that we can kind of okie doke God. Well, if the blessed are those who give, then I'll give, then you got to bless me. Now, the difference, the challenge there is the only place where that ideology can get cleared up is here. Because there's nothing in this world that teaches us and treats us like God treats us. Yes, ma'am. And I think, exactly. If, if we're not reminding ourselves of just how good God is, we're in danger of leaving our first love. Because the only thing that keeps us there is how good he is. Not how powerful he is, how good he is. Please. I understand. It's just rope. It just. That's right. That's right. So I want to talk about this just really quickly. What's Ephesus' problem? And I'm going to jump ahead. What's Laodicea's problem? Well, no, no, I, okay. They don't know they have a problem. I understand that. But what was their problem? They had left their first love. Same problem. One, well, let's see how, see other similarities. See, I told you we don't get to do this much when we're usually reading this other book. What were the people at Ephesus doing? What were they busy engaging in? Working for who? <laughs> wait, wait, wait. No, that's the trillion dollar question. What, let's look at what it says. Let's look what it says. And then we're going to go really quickly to Smyrna, because Smyrna is some powerful stuff. Let's look what it says. Verse 3. For my name's sake has labored and has not fainted. So, for his name's sake, they're laboring. Can I pick on a group of people in Matthew 7? Those preachers and those spiritual leaders in Matthew 7 that cast out demons, that did many wonderful works, in whose name did they do that stuff? But God, in the judgment, what does he say to them? I don't know you. How in the world can you do this kind of work and God not know you? Yes, sir. That does any, any other thoughts? Yes, ma'am.
I want to call. I'm going to come back to that ministerial effort. Uh, amen. Okay. Uh-huh. See, these challenges you all are presenting, they, they, con- they confound folk like me. Because I done read my Bible and God ain't never asked me to be concerned. Wait, wait, it gets better. It gets better. See, when you are driven by the who, you don't care if two show up or 2,000. Because you're driven by the who. Okay, y'all look at me like I'm making this up. When he sends out the disciples in the book of Luke, the 10th chapter, and they come back and they're bouncing off the walls about the fact that even demons move when they use his name. What did Jesus tell them? Actually, he starts out, he says, I beheld Satan. I kicked him out of heaven. Why y'all tripping? He, that's what he does when I'm around. He says, but don't get excited about that. He says, when you're ministering, you only get excited for, by the fact that your name is written in heaven. That's why whether two or 2,000 come, you ain't affected my status. Brothers at prison, we were talking about that recently because God has blessed the ministry there. We have about our church worship experience Saturday mornings comparable to what we have here. We have just that many guys. And one brother who had been there since we began, he left recently. He said, Brother Boyd, I remember when, when there weren't but three or four of us. I said, yes, sir. I said, did I teach any different with three or four? He said, no, you teach us. I said, you know why? I said, because y'all don't affect, y'all's attendance don't affect my name. And you got to get that straight in your mind. Because when you have that straight in your mind, then you're bouncing off the walls every day. Because my name, because it's so good, because my name don't deserve to be there. But it's there. That's what drives us. That's what drove the disciples of old. And it's a powerful thing because now when you're not trying to control the situation and you're accepting people for who they are and you begin to see people the way God sees them, then you stop being about me and about us. And what's driving you is you want everybody else to have their name written up there too. Elder Gibb. Please. How, how do we persevere? How do you keep on going when you don't want to go? All righty, so let's talk about the encouragement. So encouraging one another imp- causes me to infer a we. Yes, sir? It's the goodness of the fact that we have a place there. In spite of ourselves, it drives us, point and then point. L2, I've gotten to the point, if Jesus ain't in heaven, I don't want to go. I really don't. If Jesus is not going to be there, I don't want to go. Yes, sir.
Elder Manzo, the one only number we need to concern ourselves about. Well, it's the answer to this riddle. If you were to drive out Wears Ferry Road at the very end, there's this big cemetery. And the riddle is how many people in that cemetery, how many dead folk are in that cemetery? That's the only number we need to worry about. All. How many people do we want saved? Everybody. All. And it drives us. It drives us. Why? Because we want all people to enjoy what we're enjoying here and what the promise to say we're going to enjoy in the life to come. So all is what drives us. And until the clouds burst, all. Yes, ma'am. Just tell, you, tell yourself the truth. My heart ain't right today. I don't want to do it. But you know what, Master? I love you. So let's roll. And it's in that experience. That's the experience. Because, well, I want to look at Smyrna. I want to look at Smyrna because there's a, there's a tidbit here. Um, jump down to verse number 9. Revelation 2, 9. Anyone? And what does he tell us to do? What, what should our experience with those peop type of people be? Verse 10. How do I not fear the circumstances that this church at Smyrna is experiencing? How do I, how do I not fear it, though? Crown of life, being faithful. Any other thoughts? God's with me always. He doesn't lie. Any other thoughts? I'm not saying your answer is wrong. He's good stuff. So let's pause. Let's well, see, see, see. Now, uh, Elder Manzo opened up this can. It's much more complex than that. No, let's no. No, 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 no. You, you've given us the answer in, in a really wonderful way. What would cause someone who's enslaved go to the one who has enslaved him when he's ill? And say, Master, we sick. Oh, get out of the yeah. What would cause some of those same slaves, when the war breaks out, to fight on the side of the Confederacy? What would cause some of those slaves to engage with the very people who treated them less than a dog? What drives a person to deal with that in that way? Perfect love. So the way Smyrna is not afraid is God perfects love in them. 
But it ain't that mamby-pamby Hollywood love. It's the type of love that brings chastisement. <laughs> yeah, see, I, I got to say this because we out there. Anybody know Taylor Brandt? You ever heard of him? Shoot, finish. You mentioned it and I'll finish. Yes, sir. And there's plenty of Bible for folk like that. Whether you talk about Proverbs 3, be not wise in thine own eyes, or you look at Paul's counsel multiple times, think not more highly of yourself than you ought. But Taylor Branch, he's the foremost expert on the political facet of the civil rights movement. He's written volumes on it. And I heard him lecture. And so I'm sitting in the crowd, and he's just going through all the interviews he had and all the things he did. And then he said something made me sit up in my seat. He says, you know, I've studied the, all of the political facets of the civil rights movement. He says, I've, I've studied the Freedom Riders, and I've, I've studied the bus boycott, and I've, I've studied the march from Selma to Montgomery, and I've studied the efforts up in Birmingham, and I've studied even the assassination in Memphis. He says, I've come to a conclusion that if those civil rights workers had chosen any other method than nonviolence, the progress that has been made, and he says, it's far from perfect, but the progress, progress that has been made would not have been made. And when he said it, he said one thing, I heard something else. What I heard was the most powerful force in this earth ain't violence, it's love. That's the only thing you can't stop me from doing. You can stop me from hating you, but you can't stop me from loving you, not when the love of God is in my heart. And here's what's beautiful about that love. Here's what's powerful about it. When we deal with issues in this church, we act as if we're the only church that's ever had to deal with issues. When you look at the people who are standing on the sea of glass, where do they come from? Every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. What happens when you get people of various social, financial, ethnic backgrounds and you put them in one group? What's, what's the natural thing to happen? C trouble. God's been dealing with that since the beginning. He told even the Israelites coming up out of Egypt who had a mixed multitude. And I see your hand, Brother George. Had a mixed multitude. He had allowances in number 15, says when the son of a stranger starts hanging around, you let him know. He don't have one set of rules and you one set of rules. He doesn't have one form of sacrifice and you have one form. One law. So God's specialty is bringing, what's the term? The mulatto together. Because by this shall all men know that you are my disciples, not by your doctrine, but by the love that you have one another. Brother George, you got the last statement. We close with prayer. So, so, Brother George, since you brought slavery back up, just keep, I think it would be interesting, you kept one thing in mind, that slavery wouldn't buy the slave, is that God wanted to save the slave holder. But something wasn't right in his mind, in her mind. So God's always trying to save folk. And, and the folk that really needed the conversion process were the folk who were inflicting the pain, and God wanted to save them too. And so the vessel that is often used in this earth, traditionally gets the short end of the stick. But it's never as short as the stick that the vessel that God used to save mankind. That stick was mighty short. It was the shortest of shorts. So it wasn't about so much the slaves. In God's view, he wanted to save some slave masters. And he had to reveal some stuff. Let folks know that some things need to happen. Let's, let's, let's pray. 
Lord God, thank you. Thank you, Lord, for these letters. We simply ask that you would hide your word in our hearts. And unlike the church at Ephesus, well, Lord, even like them, we simply ask you would empower us to return unto our first love. And that love, Lord God, is simply you. Bless the remainder of our worship experience today. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.